Was Marilyn Monroe's real life not interesting enough? Why else would the makers of Blonde invent details about her real father, a polyamorous triad, and her affair with a president? The film attributes much of Marilyn Monroe's inner torment, professional ambition, and dysfunctional relationships to an obsessive search for the father she never knew. Early on, her mother Gladys shows a young Norma Jean Mortensen a framed photograph of a dashing older man. This man is her father, Gladys tells her, a powerful man in the movie business but whose name she can never tell. And one day I will return to Los Angeles to claim you. Monroe will spend the rest of her life seeking him out. At the height of her stardom, she begins to receive letters from a man claiming to be her father, and the cruel revelation of the letter's true author is the push that sets Monroe toward taking her own life. While it's true that Monroe was raised without a father in real life, she strongly suspected her father was a man named Charles Stanley Gifford, whom Gladys had an affair with while working as a film editor at RKO Pictures. In 1952, Monroe even attempted to contact him, according to biographer Charles Casillo, and the anonymous letters signed Tearful Father are an invention of the novel and film. In 2022, a French DNA researcher apparently proved that Gifford and Monroe were related. His findings were broadcast in the documentary Marilyn her final secret. Marilyn Monroe's fraught upbringing with her mother Gladys is represented primarily by two hellish, frightening sequences early in the film. The first is when Gladys puts young Norma Jean in their car and attempts to drive into the Griffith Park wildfire of 1933. The second is when she tries to drown her daughter in the bathtub. After the bathtub incident, Gladys is hospitalized and confined to a mental institution for the rest of her life. Norma Jean, after being cared for by her neighbors for a short time, is dropped off at an orphanage. When she sees her mother again ten years later, Norma Jean has transformed fully into Marilyn, and Gladys, in the throes of schizophrenia, doesn't recognize her. While the specific incidents presented here may not be confirmed, both Gladys and her mother, Della Monroe, were known to have violent outbursts related to mental illness. Monroe's earliest years were mostly spent in the care of family friends. In an incident detailed in J. Randy Terraborelli's book, The Secret Life of Marilyn Monroe, Della talked her way into the home where infant Norma Jean was living and tried to smother her with a pillow. Later, when Norma Jean was three, Gladys attempted to abduct her by stuffing her in a duffel bag. After Gladys was institutionalized in 1934, Norma Jean was a ward of the state, living in orphanages and foster homes before being taken in by family friend Grace Goddard at age 11. In Blonde, Marilyn Monroe's big break comes after years spent as a pinup model when she's offered an audition for a studio mogul referred to as Mr. Z, played by David Warshawski. Stepping into an intimidating office full of taxidermied animals, Monroe nervously reads her script in front of a silent Mr. Z until the man steps behind her, still without a word, and sexually assaults her. Later in the film, when she's talking about the beginning of her career with the ex-athlete, the film's stand-in for second husband Joe DiMaggio, played by Bobby Cannavale, Marilyn flashes back to this moment and simply tells him that she was, quote, discovered. Mr. Z is by all accounts an avatar for 20th Century Fox head Daryl F. Zanuck. Monroe was under contract at Fox for much of her film career, and she and Zanuck are known to have had a difficult working relationship. Monroe bristled at the dumb blonde role she was regularly offered, while he considered her simply that, a dumb blonde. And while tales of the casting couch were common in Hollywood both then and now, according to biographer Anthony Summers, there's no evidence that Zanuck assaulted Monroe in this manner. As to her being discovered, Fox's official story was that she'd been discovered while babysitting for a casting director, initially hiding the fact that she'd been a pinup and occasional nude model for years before being cast in her first film. In Blonde, Marilyn Monroe is seen in 1951 auditioning for the Richard Widmark thriller Don't Bother to Knock. In a tight close-up mimicking the angle of the screen test's camera, Monroe gives an intense, soul-bearing monologue. The role is uncomfortably close to her own life, a woman whose mother was abusive and whose father had abandoned her long ago. After she's done, she pleads for another chance but is taken away by her manager. The crew is dumbfounded by what they saw as a terrible performance, but the director is captivated by her looks. The scene treats Monroe as if she's an unknown at this time, as if she's never stepped in front of the camera. In reality, she was a sensation almost from the moment she appeared on film. In fact, the year before, she'd made two of her most notable early movies, All About Eve and John Huston's noir The Asphalt Jungle. She'd even weathered a scandal involving nude photos she'd posed for in 1949. As for Don't Bother to Knock, the film received mixed reviews, but Monroe's performance was singled out for praise. With Variety writing, Marilyn Monroe gives an excellent account of herself in a strictly dramatic role. 
Marilyn Monroe was romantically linked to any number of Hollywood luminaries in the early 1950s before her relationship with Joe DiMaggio, including Marlon Brando and director Elia Kazan. The film represents this time in her life by focusing on an unconventional romance with two show business scions, Charlie Chaplin Jr., nicknamed Cass, and Edward G. Robinson Jr., known as Eddie G. Monroe envies them because everyone in the world knows who their fathers are, while Cass and Eddie G envy her for the fact that she's an orphan and can make herself into anything she wishes. We're juniors, of men who never wanted us. The three do everything together, and when Monroe gets pregnant, they celebrate as a group. Monroe was involved with Chaplin in real life for a short time, according to biographer Anthony Summers, but the relationship apparently came to an end after she had an affair with Chaplin's brother. Robinson isn't known to have dated Monroe or Chaplin, either separately or in the polyamorous triad the film depicts. The film also has Chaplin dying before Monroe, and in a posthumous communication to her, he reveals that he was the author of all the letters her father wrote to her. In real life, Chaplin would outlive Monroe by six years, dying in 1968 at age 42. In the film, Marilyn Monroe box at her contracted $500 a week salary for appearing in Howard Hawks' musical Gentlemen Prefer Blondes when she learns that co-star Jane Russell is making $100,000. After all, she's the blonde of the title. And I'm playing the blonde in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes? That's an insult. But there are other complications in taking the role beyond money. Her pregnancy is a professional barrier, and she also fears that her mother's mental illness could be hereditary. At the studio's insistence, Monroe decides to terminate the pregnancy, leading to the first of the film's two graphic abortion sequences. Verifying the accuracy of Monroe's abortions, or even if she had any, is difficult. It was illegal nationwide to terminate a pregnancy in 1953, and the notion that Monroe had several abortions in the course of her life was popularized by author Gloria Steinem in her 1986 biography Marilyn Norma Jean. However, it is known that Monroe was paid considerably less for her star-making role in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. It was one of many small insults during her time under the thumb of Daryl F. Zanuck and a large part of her motivation to break her contract with Fox and start her own production company. This, however, is a chapter in her life that the film ignores, along with any other sense that Monroe was an active participant in her career. After Marilyn Monroe's abusive marriage to the ex-athlete ends in divorce, she retreats to New York City to study acting. When the playwright, the film's stand-in for Arthur Miller, played by Adrian Brody, sees her in a reading of one of his plays, he assumes that she's been cast because the director is in love with her. But as the lights come up after the reading, the playwright is in tears at her performance. Monroe impresses him with how well-read she is, while she connects to his gentle intellectualism, a complete opposite of the prudish brutality of the ex-athlete. The two marry in 1956. The film frames the play reading as the first time they meet. The playwright has heard of her, obviously, but they don't know each other. In real life, Miller and Monroe met in Los Angeles in 1950. The two would correspond off and on over the years until reconnecting in New York in 1955 while Monroe was studying at the actor's studio and managing her own production company. Miller, however, was married at the time of their affair and under investigation by the House Un-American Activities Committee for alleged communist affiliations. There is nothing a politician won't stoop to if it means some publicity for him or some power. Monroe stood by him through both his divorce and his legal troubles, none of which is given any space in Andrew Dominic's film. The affair between Marilyn Monroe and John F. Kennedy has always been the stuff of second-hand reports and urban legends rather than established fact. According to Donald Spoto's comprehensive 1993 biography of Monroe, the two were only ever seen in public together four times. Biographer Anthony Summers, on the other hand, treats it very much as a fact that she was involved with both JFK and his brother Robert, that her final days were preoccupied with thoughts of both men, and that JFK may have even visited her in California shortly before her death. The film dramatizes her alleged relationship with Kennedy via a nightmarish sequence in which an inebriated Monroe is escorted off an airplane by Secret Service agents, literally dragged through the back hallways of a New York hotel. She's then placed in the president's hotel room, where she's essentially forced to do something against her will. Afterward, she's escorted right back out by Secret Service. That nightmare feeling continues in a later scene where she dreams of men kidnapping her in the middle of the night and forcibly removing what we're to assume is her baby with the president, the second of the film's explicit and disturbing abortion scenes. During Blonde, it's 1962, and Marilyn Monroe receives a call from Eddie G with the sad news that Cass has died. He informs her that Cass left her something and to watch out for a delivery. When that delivery comes, it's an old stuffed tiger like the one she had as a girl, along with a note containing a terrible, cruel confession. 
Cass was the one writing letters to her, claiming to be her father. The revelation sends Monroe into a tailspin of anguish. Standing by the pool of her Hollywood home, she swallows dozens of pills one after the other. She strips off her clothes and climbs into bed, takes the phone off the hook, and passes out. As she slowly dies, she has a vision of the man she thought was her father, his face beckoning her from the heavens. However, Monroe knew who her father was, and neither Cass nor anyone else wrote her letters like that. The entire sequence, other than the condition Monroe's body was found in, is a flight of fancy. So what might have happened? The Los Angeles coroner at the time ruled her death a probable suicide due to the sheer amount of barbiturates she'd ingested. Yet her personal correspondence from that time, collected and published in 2010 as the book Fragments, shows a side of her that finally felt on firm ground, leading credence to the idea that her death was accidental. If you or anyone you know has been a victim of sexual assault, help is available. Visit the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network website or contact RAIN's National Helpline at 1-800-656-HOPE-4673.